subcommittee will resume its uh, hearing. The chair would like to make a request uh, of, uh, of his colleagues. Uh, very grateful for Mr. DiClerio's appearance, his very extensive testimony. Uh, but he does have a heart condition, and I would like to <coughs> move towards uh, uh, excusing him before too long. I want my colleagues to ask questions that they wish, but we should be mindful of his medical condition. Congressman Chase. Mr. Leclerio, I really appreciate you being here, and um, I, I know you understand we have a job to do, and, and uh, we, we try to do it as best we can, and uh, sometimes we do it better than other times. Uh, it's just very clear to me, um, and I was very moved by uh, thinking of, of what you've done for your country and, and how you've worked very hard to protect your country from the enemy without, uh, from the outside. What we're looking at is the enemy from within. <clears throat> we're looking at the enemy that um, basically attempted to seize control of $11 billion operation, uh, we're looking at an enemy that calls into question whether we as a nation can run a basic department. And uh, if, if the answer is that uh, we can't defend ourselves from the enemy within, uh, we've got a big problem as a nation. So I just feel that uh, we've got a task to do and we're just going to try to do it as best we can. And with this in mind, you could help me understand this enemy. Uh, I need to know, uh, first off, you received a $15,000 payment from a developer in Puerto Rico and gave $5,000 of it to Lance Wilson. <coughs> I need to know who that developer was. Congressman Shays, I was just asked that question three or four times. Uh, must be a long-winded answer. And... Uh, I'm just going to say, uh, just, I'm, I do want to cooperate with the chairman, but um, I have a number of questions, and I hope they're, um, you have free to answer any way you want, but that's your choice. Congressman, yeah. I do have a heart condition. I just took a glycerin, and usually it works perfectly. I do not like to uh, use any excuse for not answering. I want to answer all questions. So please, if I do not feel well, I will state so. But please, <laughs> ask any question. And I will definitely answer unless I'm carried out. Okay, let me just say, uh, no, I, no, that would not be pleasing well, to me. Well, I'm willing to go that far. <laughs> no, I'm not. So, <laughs> I, 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 so I, I'm going to put this on the record so I don't have any guilty conscience here. Um, <laughs> if you are not feeling well, you let me know and uh, we'll end fine. the questioning. My question is, who gave you the $15,000 right. check? The long answer is this. In uh, 19... Can, can you make it a brief answer? Well, because we have three other witnesses, Okay, Mr. the Nicario. answer is I don't know. In 1986, I went to a uh, uh, hospital in Patterson, and I was told I had to get a triple bypass, and I was a sick man when I retired. I could not walk two blocks. Uh, I got the phone call, and the man insisted that I represent him because he heard me speak in Puerto Rico, and he heard of my, et cetera, and he insisted on it, and I told him I would get him some help. It's my understanding and, that you don't know, uh, but he paid you $15,000. Was that in cash or by no, a check? A check. Okay, can you produce the check for us? If, if I... Uh, uh, let me just ask, that's my request. Um, uh, if through your attorney, uh, if your attorney would try to locate that $15,000 check. All right, uh, the answer is, and I'm not familiar with the procedure, what I did, I have two partners, my sons, I was not well, I sent the check to my son, because he sent the check to my home, I believe, and they deposited it. Uh, if there is a procedure, which I'm sure there must be, of getting the check, I would really like to know because I feel a little stupid here stating I don't know who sent me the check. And I certainly want to get the check. And if it's possible, I will get the check. I think they have a record deck. <coughs> well, I, I was told yeah, I'm just, to I'm just going to say, I'm going to say, I understand why you and, and your circumstance may not have uh, remembered who the developer was. But I just would like, uh, since uh, you do have an attorney here, I would like through, through you to the attorney to just uh, locate that check. We'd like to know who the developer was. That is a very important uh, question that, that uh, is, I think, justifies an answer. And I understand why you can't answer now. 
Um, with regard to uh, Ritz Towers, uh, the $10,000 check that you paid Lance Wilson, uh, how much did you basically receive for this project? Received three payments. With the initial approval, a SAMA, that is terminology used, summary approval, I received $40,000. With the firm commitment issued, <clears throat> I received $70,400, uh, $74,400. And when the project was initially endorsed, meaning start of construction, I received $260,400. That's the additional or that's the that's the that's three checks, three okay. sums, okay. totaling uh, three hundred and seventy four thousand eight hundred. Now, and uh, is your testimony that that when you uh, in the process of working on this project, had you been away from HUD for for a year's time or two years time? Uh, I was away 11 months, but I did not represent them at HUD. That is the reason I did not receive the full fee. <clears throat> that is the reason that I want and company did the paperwork, the applications, and going to the office until such time that my one year has elapsed because this application was not in the office when I was there. I had an, was only a thought in Jason Carter's mind, and I, the, re, the requirement is one year, and did, I definitely. Did Ritz Towers have any relationship with HUD before the, your time had elapsed? In other words, I'm unclear about this. <coughs> did, did they have a relationship with HUD and that you uh, chose not to be used as the contact? I guess that's the reason why Lance Wilson was hired, correct? No, uh, sir. Okay. No, why? sir. No, sir. Not at all, sir. If I make this clear, sure. Ritz Tower's site was a restaurant, Mama Leone's restaurant. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay. It was a restaurant. And uh, after I retired, the site was purchased by Jason Carter. And with this, he, I don't know, by prior arrangement, I guess, had the Mamalioni restaurant evicted or moved, or I don't know what terminology was. They were no longer there. And Jason Carter, unbeknownst to me, never participated in any government housing projects before. I never met him, did not know him. He heard of me through other people and asked me to have lunch with him and made the proposal to me to represent him. Okay, but that, that was uh, before you had finished your full year of... of 11 months after okay. and... Uh, so then another month came by and you worked for him and then you could legally have dealings with HUD. Is that correct? Yes, but I did not go to HUD immediately because I worked with the architects and attorneys and, and revamping the plans and specifications, and I think it took three to four to five months before we went to HUD. Okay, let me ask you another area question, Stud. <coughs> did you, uh, uh, really a continuation, did, did you ever hire Lance Wilson for anything else other than those two uh, projects, the 5,000 and 10,000? Absolutely not. The only three things with Lance were the one that he called me when I worked for HUD and the two incidents that I reported here. Okay. So, okay, your only contacts with him, but the only time was once when you were at HUD, but then once after you left HUD, twice. Twice. Okay. Um, did you ever hire anyone else who had worked for HUD uh, to, um, to help you in your dealings with HUD? <coughs> Besides no, Lance Wilson? No, sir. Can you tell me, um, did you have any involvement with the um, uh, First American Housing Preservation Association? Are you familiar at all with that, that yes, group? Yes, I am. Okay. Now, um, the reason I'm asking you this is that we had Mr. Monticello who came before us, and uh, he made a number of statements. I mean, basically what we had here was seven projects. Someone was allowed to buy in. These uh, developers were allowed to buy these projects, uh, seven projects uh, for approximately $11 billion. Million, uh, and they got almost exclusive HUD financing. They put a half a million dollars down. They sold it uh, a few years later, these properties, for $27 uh, million, uh, grossing a, uh, a profit of $16 million. Um, <coughs> Mr. Monticello subsequently ended up working for the very people that uh, had been involved with this project, having a 15% equity in a realty firm and also being on their payroll at $125,000 a year. <coughs> That's 
the project, how were you involved in this? Did you ever recommend, for instance, that these properties be allowed to be purchased by this investment group? It has to be an answer that I cannot rush. I had no involvement whatsoever. This was in a unique situation where I believe there were four defaulted complexes of buildings in New York, Queens. Let me, let me just say, you may have answered the question. Are you saying that you were not involved in any way in any aspect of this? No, I did not say that, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I said at the inception. Okay. When the defaulted projects, four in Queens. Yes. Two in New Jersey, and one, I believe, in Bridgeport, Connecticut. There Connecticut. might have been two in Bridgeport. Pardon me? Well, there might have been okay. two. But anyway, there were okay. seven properties. This was something that was worked out in Washington. And I was told, and what I heard Mr. Monticello testify, that he had meetings with people in Washington and that they hired by contract a person to work in the New York office on this matter. I had no involvement whatsoever. However, once the contract was executed, and work began on the project. They hired, no, they, hi they had the hired person. They put a special inspector to do the inspecting. Now, on all HUD construction projects, there are monthly advances that are released predicated on the amount of work done. In the book, HUD's book, FHA book, it states it has to go from an inspector to mortgage credit to the director of housing. I was told that I could depend on the inspector. I certainly could not, with 400 projects, be running to New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York, and still continue my work in Puerto Rico, and Camden, and Buffalo, etc. I relied on the comments of the pro progress of the work completed by the inspector, and I would affix my name to the release of the money and it would go to an authorized agent after I more or less agreed with the procedure of the amount of work done. That was the extent of my participation. <clears throat> hey, did you ever recommend that these properties be allowed to be sold once they were bought? Well, I had the advantage of watching television and heard that statement. Uh, uh, do you understand why it's important then for me course, to ask it? Of course, it's extremely important. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is, Mr. Sheldon Goldstein, who is now partners with Mr. Monticello, uh, negotiated to purchase these properties in Washington, and he had a contract. This contract was done legally, and it had terminology in it as to his rights. Again, each month as the progress of construction completed, it had to pass my desk for signature. <clears throat> And I'm only uh, going by memory. And I may add and interrupt my statement. Sure. I made every effort to review the files. And I'm not taking any fifth or even annoyed by the fact the files were not available to me. They stated they were with the IG and they were not available to me. And then another time I was called to go to New York because the files were there and I went there and they weren't there. And I said, well, there are only two floors down. Why can't I get the, I get the file? And they said, well, I have to clear with Washington. Then Washington called back and said, it's up to New York. No, let me just ask you this, though. Is there any name that comes to mind in terms of their saying you have to clear with someone else? And just yes. Kind of well, the Freedom of Information Officer, <laughs> I remember the name very clearly. Wait, wait a second. Kim. <laughs> you, lit you literally had to go to Freedom of Information to get documents in which to base a decision? Congressman says, I had to go to Edmund Davis. And he told me I had to wait 10 days on files I had to go to a man who accused me of something. I can get excited. <laughs> I had to go to the man who accused me of stating that I did this on my own, Winbrook, when he prepared all the memorandum and he had press releases on the matter and he stated he knew nothing about it. I had to beg and this gentleman, him. This gentleman is who now? Edmund Davis, the one that the Secretary Pierce appointed okay. as my boss. Okay. And he sat there two weeks ago. The rules say you must wait 10 days. 
<coughs> well, I only speak four languages, and I told him four different languages that I didn't think that it was proper. And he said, after 10 days, I can go back and look at the file. And I was called by the office. I did not go. Uh, let, me, and let me be clear on this, and I'm going <coughs> to relinquish my, uh, my question, but I, I want to be clear. <coughs> you, were, you had a responsibility uh, somehow to pass judgment on the sale of these properties. Is that correct? Pardon me, sir? You had a responsibility somehow to pass uh, judgment on the sale of these properties. Is that correct? No, sir. Not on the sale of the properties. Okay. I only... What was your... What, what did you have to, to decide, and why did you need these documents? No, I did not have to decide anything. After the properties were sold, okay. they were in... So they were, needed rehabilitation, yeah. or they needed work to be done. Right. And that was another phase of it. Okay, Mr. And Gold when this work was done, I only affixed my name to a monthly advance as a result of the inspector's report. Let me be clear on this. First American Housing Preservation Association, Association bought seven properties. Then they had various um, monies from HUD uh, that were coming due as they proceeded to improve the properties. Separate and apart from the purchase. Yes. Separate and apart. Okay. They then and that's asked why for you got involved. I only got involved because an inspector physically inspects and states 20%, 40%, okay. or 80% of the right. total is completed with a 10% holdback, and it comes to my desk, and I merely okay. take the work. Uh, uh, finally, these properties were sold. Uh, they were sold at a, 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 a <coughs> colossal profit, a colossal profit. Um, did you in any way recommend that these properties be sold? Did you rec in any way recommend, <coughs> let me ask that first question. The question was a long time ago, and I, I'm going to you answer don't, it If you don't now. know the answer, you no, can tell I me. I know the okay. answer. Okay. I know the answer. Not Sheldon Goldstein, but a partner of his who is the, I forgot his name, who is up in Connecticut, and I'm sure his name is in the record. Ja is that Jack O'Connell? Jack O'Connell. Yeah. Used to come for the monthly advances, and he said to me, which I had no authority, he says, you know, we'd like to sell us. I said, well, why don't you sell it in accordance with the contract? There's a huge difference. Now, even if I made a comment, I said in accordance with the contract, but even if I didn't, I had no authority. He knew that. He and Mr. Goldstein prepared a letter to Mr. Monticello. Mr. Monticello sent the letter to Washington. If I made a statement, I would think it would be proper for a copy to come to me or before it was sent to Washington for me to comment on it. I never saw the memo, and I never made the statement other than, hey, if you want something, take care of it in accordance with the contract. Okay. That's all I stated. Well, he, I think this uh, congressman knows what a contract was. Contract was that a good portion of the money had to be uh, given to the federal government. Now, isn't it true that one-fourth of all the profit from the sale of these seven properties was supposed to come back I to the I think that's what the yeah. contract stated, yes. Now, it, it's alleged that when the property was sold that less than one-fourth came back to, to the HUD and to the taxpayers. Do you have any understanding or uh, do, were you involved no in that? that I was not involved in that at all. So basically, your, your comments to, to me is that uh, Jack O'Connell had talked about how he'd like to sell it in these seven properties. Your point was, well, under the contract, you're probably entitled to. Why don't you just do that? And that's the last you had with this organization? Well, it was not a meeting, Congressman. It was a statement. He was waiting for his monthly advance, I'm, I'm, and he was griping that, well, you know, why can't they do something? I say, hey, you know, if you want, sell it in accordance with the contract. But it was just a, an off-the-cuff remark that I didn't think merited discussion because I had no authority to make it. And if I was in error for making the remark, yes, I made the remark, pay off in accordance with the contract. Why did he exclude the last few words? Yeah. It's a big difference there. Right. Um, were you, I just want to be clear for the record, and I think it's to your advantage to have this part of the record clarified. Uh, did you in any way after that assist this group in selling the property or in uh, finding a way to pay less than the 25% back to the federal government? Absolutely not. Okay. Have you had any uh, financial dealings with this organization since you've left HUD? The only thing that happened, Mr. Monticello, uh, realizing, again, my attorney asked me not to brag, realizing the years that I served there and my knowledge, 
attempted to get me to work with them. And in fact, he and Mr. Litt called me and prepared a contract for me to work with them so that we can get involved in housing. This is after you left HUD? Talking about two or three months ago. Okay. And uh, the contract remains unsigned. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate the candor of the witness. I don't think I have any other question. Um, we may need to call some other witnesses before us. <coughs> First. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you, sir. Congressman Thank you. Schumann. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will be mindful of your need to move things along and uh, the witness's condition. I appreciate him being here and speaking to us without any rigmarole, without taking the fifth or whatever else. Uh, let me uh, ask a couple of things. This Ritz, I'm very troubled by this Ritz Plaza development because the issue really is, are things done when consultants or whatever get involved that wouldn't be done on the merits and be done otherwise. <coughs> and here you have a luxury building. And the luxury building is getting FHA financing. When we've been running a fight in Congress to try and even get the FHA limits lifted. And it seems to have been done through your work. And uh, I guess uh, it was testified that it was Mr. Wilson. Uh, no, excuse, uh, you don't want me to interrupt you? I don't mind either way. Uh, my question, and then I'll let you answer, is how typical was it for buildings that had such high rentals to get, the, uh, to get that kind of federal housing insurance? Congressman, you live in New York. All over New York, there are mortgage insurance. Lincoln Center, across the street from Lincoln Center, there are FHA-insured mortgages. On uh, 90 but these require a waiver. No. Right. Uh, uh, well, let, okay, I'm going to play with the word waiver. A waiver, to me, means receive something out of the ordinary. You mean any building in New York, whether it be the most luxury building, let's say it's only <coughs> triplexes on Park Avenue, can get a waiver pro forma for FHA insurance? When you say waiver, sir... Can get FHA insurance for yes, some Yes, the procedure. answer is yes. If the mortgagor is willing to put up the difference of the statutory mortgage and the total cost. Now, in the Ritz... The well, wait, explain that to me. The difference is probably more than the insurance, so you better explain that. Of course, it always is. Yeah. The law states that a mortgage is predicated on a lower of various criteria. <coughs> one is cost, 90% of cost. Yeah. The second one is the statutory mortgage. Right. And the third is debt service. In this particular project, the total development cost is $123 million. Right. The mortgage was $84 million. Right. That means... Yeah, it was less than 90%. I understand that. But... And the mortgage would have been 84 million if the cost were 94 million instead of 123 million. And 100, the difference between 84 million and 123 million comes from Jason Scarter pocket in one form or the other. Why did he need you if this is so? Why did he have to pay you $200,000 or whatever the number was <coughs> when you added all that up? He paid me more than 200000 Yeah, I understand. <laughs> uh, it said uh, 200000 in the article in the uh, newspaper, but it's obviously if, a if close to double If I read the that. article, I would get sick. The article, unfortunately, is not aware of mortgage insurance. The, uh, the article says it was a $35 million mortgage. Well, to me, or even the people who were supplying the information, really know nothing about mortgage you're insurance. You're saying, just let me, because I can cut through this, you're saying that anyone who applies gets this automatically, this is, uh, gets the amount of the FHA mortgage automatically. Is that no, what you're saying? No, I did not say that. Okay. I stated that anyone who builds in a high-cost area, right, and any project, be it subsidized, 221D4, subject to Section 8, in the South Bronx, or Bed-Stuy, or Harlem, they all get what is called a waiver. Well, I know that 221D4s get it. I this didn't is a 221D4. This is a 221D4. Yes, without subsidy. So you're saying any 221D4 gets it? Absolutely. So there's no waiver. In so why fact, do they need you? Why do they need me? Yeah. 
because... I mean, you can't say it both ways. You can't say, well, it's done as of right, and then say, no, no. well, I was hired as a valuable consultant and worked Congress, you were You were at a meeting that I spoke with Congressman Rangel, and I think you and Congressman Rangel compliment me on being innovative and doing things that other people there couldn't do. Yeah, uh, but how I didn't why know you were that innovative. <laughs> you didn't. I'm well, teasing. I'm happy that I yeah. am. But uh, why don't you explain it? Yeah, of course. If you could. you got to understand the mortgage insurance, a cost... In New York, there is no problem at I all underst cost. I right. understand dead New York service. is a high cost area. Right. In debt service, there is no problem. I'm right. sorry for interrupting you. No, go ahead. All right. In debt service, meaning the amount of money you can generate income, removing from that the operating expenses, gives you sufficient money to meet the obligation. There is no question of 48th Street with the housing and all the amenities of other things there. There is no question. The only problem is the statutory mortgage. Now, it, the people who were representing Jason Carter were talking about a mortgage of 74, 75 million. Right. I sat in there and I told him, wait, we have to make changes in this plan. The law says you get X dollars for a zero bedroom apartment, so much for a one bedroom, so much for two bedroom. Right. And then you get an amount of non-residential. I said, therefore, we have to redo the plan and specification in accordance with the law to realize a higher mortgage. And that's so you, what I did. And I said the air rights that he purchased gave him an ability to construct. Okay. Let me much. ask you, after you did the work of showing them how to conform with the law, did you then make calls to HUD to try and get this thing through? No, I didn't have to call anyone. The application for mortgage insurance went in and it was justified on, the cost was $123 million. Okay. The rents, I had to supply comparable rents. Yeah. I had to give land values. And on a project analysis, it gives uh, five other comparables right in the immediate area. And I'm sure you, Congressman, know what's going on around 48th Street. And the, I think the land value should have been higher. Mm -hmm. So you did no <laughs> lobbying at HUD for this. You simply told them lobbying? how to... Lobbying? I didn't want to get killed. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't yeah. lobby. Let me ask you, so this article doesn't seem to be quite accurate, is what you're saying. Oh, no, I don't say it's not accurate. It, it, if my uh, granddaughter wrote it, she could have written a better article about the facts of HUD and mortgage insurance. Okay, let me ask you another general question. You've mentioned before that you've listened to some of these hearings on television. You've read what's said in the paper. Are there any things that... I know the, con uh, the chairman asked a couple of questions. Are there other things that other witnesses said that are untrue and you would like to rebut? This is your chance. <laughs> Do we have all day, Congressman? <laughs> How about a few, and then you can submit others in writing I, to this. I, I'd ask let me be permission, fair. Mr. Chairman, that he could submit any that he doesn't have time for no, no, all day I, in writing. No, I don't. Uh, let, me, let me be fair to everyone to testify. Uh, the only thing I can say is Particularly I... Particularly the ones that involved you. There were some statements that you did this, you did that. Well, it's, it's evident that Mr. Davis made a statement that, and if Davis I... Davis wasn't a witness here, as well, I... If, well, a phone call was made from the subcommittee to him approximately uh, two months ago, and he stated, I repeat, Neclario did it on his own, and I don't know why, and I'd rather not get into it. Uh, you know what that does for a man with a weak heart? Makes it much weaker, knowing how he got his job, and knowing he, he had all the press conferences, and knowing I have memorandum here, put his name to it, and he is permitted to sit there and take advantage of his position because he's protected by someone. The only protection I had was hard work. Okay, let me ask you another question about these, uh, the thing in uh, Puerto Rico, uh, where it was mentioned before that you got a weekend call from Mr. Wilson, and uh, he said somebody was a, a supporter of the vice president. Uh, was that fairly typical? It was the first call I got like that. Was it the only call you ever got like that? To look into matters? To uh -huh. say, a weekend call, emergency, let's get this done. Someone I is a supporter of so-and-so, and we have to get it done. What that implies is, uh -huh. don't look at it on the merits, do it for other reasons. No, no, they told me to look at it, the merits and find a way of doing it legally. They did not tell me to do it illegally. They told me to go down there because they did felt Did you get other calls that you would characterize no. as like that one in your, in your <coughs> years at HUD, in your 47 years or Well, whatever. I go back so many years, one time way back on the project. How about on, in the last 10? 
Ten years? When was uh, the building built on 23rd Street? The two plexes and three plexes. I know my district pretty well, but I don't know when the building <laughs> Well, anyway, that was a job I objected to that was subsidized housing where it started at 49 million and it ended up at 200 million with duplexes and triplexes and uh, it's a subsidized project. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you two other questions, general questions. Can't think of any others or none no. others? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> uh, it was a job I objected to that was subsidized housing where it started at 49 million and it ended up at 200 million with duplexes and triplexes and uh, it's a subsidized project. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you two other questions, general questions. Can't think of any others or none no. others? No. 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 Okay. Uh, what were your observations of HUD under Pierce? Was it run differently? Did you notice uh, things deteriorated? <coughs> Uh, what I noted, uh, I mean, you're a man who has pride in his work, and you've mentioned that repeatedly to yes, us. Secretary and Pierce was secretary. Uh, never, I never saw him at an official meeting. I never uh, had any discussions in his office other than the phone call that I related to. But in the past, I met with Carla Hills. I met with... Uh, uh, most every other secretary of housing, and I felt good doing something when they were trying to do a good job, and, and I uh, could not speak, and I think it's on a record. I was asked to be, uh, go into a committee to make recommendations to Congress. I was chosen as the uh, four people in the nation to work out the troubled projects in New York on the Mitchell Lama program. I did that, and I always felt the pride that my work was being recognized. I never got that feeling, Secretary Pierce. I always felt... Were decisions made less on the merits under Pierce's HUD and more on the politics than in previous times? Oh, I, I definitely think so, even though it existed in the past. Uh, it, not it to the extent. It clearly existed in the past. Yeah. And I mean, it's yes. one of the gray areas of this hearing, yes, obviously. Yes. It's not all clear cut, but uh, <coughs> you would characterize it as quite different under I Pierce. I would say much more so under Pierce's administration. Was that right from the beginning, or did it get worse over the years, at least up until the time you were there? I think after, it got worse later on after they detected that Secretary Pierce was, uh, you know, not really uh, involved unless he was interested. Not really? Involved unless he was interested. And when was he interested? I don't know. What about the New York office? Did that change? He stopped grunting. <laughs> That'll be my, I understand. That'll be, and I know Mr. Morrison has to hurry. What about, what about that? Uh, the New York office? Oh, yeah, the, the objection I have is that perhaps four to six people are politically appointed. The regional administrator, deputy, and the executive assistant, and special assistant, and uh, be it a person like myself working all the years and as aggressive and, and uh, assured as I thought I was, you are always subjected to an executive assistant or special assistant or someone who got the job politically to come in and sit at a meeting or come in and voice an opinion when you really like to throw them out. And you can't because you know what's behind them. I don't know if that answers your question, but I think it really destroys the ability of a person. And there are so many good people in the offices, and I worked in California on detail, and I worked in Puerto Rico and in Jersey and Bum and I know there are many, many good people, but they just don't come to the top because the system does not permit so them. You would recommend that the appointments of people in the regional offices be made on the merits as opposed to the politics? I would recognize that the top position must go politically to carry out the wishes of the how is it be? Well, that's not how it is in, say, Great Britain. Well, I, I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't okay. know. I don't want to get into an exposition of Great Britain, but it doesn't have is, to be. I think the system is to pick one person with qualifications to run the office politically and then have everyone else earn their right to their job. And uh, there are certain positions now in various offices where it is 
disgraceful and hurtful to a person who spent years there when a director of housing does not want to make a decision because he doesn't know what the decision is and says, I'm going to hold that two or three months because I'm afraid to make a decision. And I heard this, and I get complaints from people, and I tell them, this I got my own problems answering questions here. Uh, I can't be, uh, the fact that I worked all those years, but that is what happens to officers. People get their positions politically who are not qualified, and it's totally wrong. The top position, I feel, must be political appointed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, before I call on Congressman Morrison, let me just say, your last comment obviously applies to many, many areas of our government. That is why I introduced legislation to drastically limit the number of political appointees who can serve abroad as United States ambassadors, because the extent to which ambassadorial appointments have become politicized is not only a disgrace and a disservice to the large number of qualified uh, career foreign service officers, but uh, hurts the United States enormously in, in, in its dealings with, uh, with many countries abroad. Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. DeClaro, thank you for being here. I think the, uh, everyone appreciates the effort you've made to come forward and to provide information. And uh, it is in contrast to others who, um, who feel that, uh, that telling the truth might create problems for them. And I, uh, I really just want to explore two areas briefly. Uh, first, to follow up on, on some questions that my colleague from Connecticut, Mr. Shays, asked about the, um, um, the deal that, uh, uh, that your name has been associated with in terms of, uh, of the seven properties. Uh, first, I'd just, just to say something as an introductory matter, um, the critical exercise of discretion that made that deal what it was after the acquisition. The acquisition itself was questionable. Seven properties picked out by particular developers who wanted those properties and who could deal with those properties because of other arrangements in place uh, became almost a sole source uh, acquisition. There are questions about that, but I don't want to explore that at this moment. I think Mr. Shays was exploring that. But after the acquisition, these properties were defaulted properties and they were subject to a congressionally imposed requirement that, they, that uh, preservation of these properties for low and minute, moderate income housing were necessary and therefore there was a 15 year prepayment limitation. And obviously that 15 year prepayment limitation had to do with what the cost of the projects were, what the value was in a marketplace sense initially. Of course, if you take that uh, prepayment requirement off, you're selling to a different market. People can acquire these properties and have charge higher rents and uh, not be subject to the regulatory agreement, et cetera. And that's what went on here. The critical uh, exercise of discretion that made these people this bundle of money, leaving aside whether they gave back to the government the share they should have, uh, any amount of money that was realized in here was really a windfall from the removal of a regulatory requirement. Would you agree with that? as an analysis of, of what happened in terms of, of this huge profit that was turned? You know, I really find it difficult to respond to anything with these projects because I attempted to review the file even though I did not participate other than what I stated. I signed uh, monthly advances in the construction of rehabilitation. I had no part of the sale. I had no part of this position. I had no part of any of it, it was handled directly by Washington through the regional administrator and a contracted person that they chose to contract with independent of the New York office. But that, just, just to clarify, what you've just talked about is the initial purchase by, the, by this uh, partnership uh, and then the rehabilitation process that went on that was funded with the HUD insured mortgages, correct? I mean, what you've just described, well, that's where the contract personnel was used to oversee that? Well, yes, I believe so. But you've got to understand, I'm trying to answer questions when the files were not available oh, to I me, and I had nothing to do with it. So I think it is an error for me to even comment okay. on something I had nothing to do with. Okay. But I do want to come to, the, to this critical point, and, and uh, I do believe that the critical fact about this being turned from a um, preservation of low and moderate income housing stock <clears throat> into a great big profit for developers was that this 15-year prepayment requirement 
was removed. And that was removed uh, by Washington. No question about that. And Mr. Monticello made the recommendation. But the memo that he sent uh, involved uh, uh, saying, as stated, the attaches a response to Mr. Niclerio's <coughs> suggestion of a full payoff. Now, I understand that uh, this is not the part of the purchase. This is the paying off of the mortgage. No, no, excuse me, sir. Yeah. Did I prepare a memorandum? No, no, and I didn't say you did. I, I understand it. I, Mr. Goldstein or whoever, Jack O'Connell, could have said anything. No, I understand. I want to. I give think you proper procedure would be to clear through me. If, if, if you'd let me just... Okay, I'm sorry. No, I understand it. Don't worry. I un, I, I'm, you're going to get plenty of an opportunity to clarify. I'm not looking to... I'm looking to clarify what, who did what to whom, because the bottom line here <laughs> is somebody in Washington, for whatever reason, approved what to me was a very bad deal for the people of the United States. We had these properties. We funded getting them fixed up, and they should have been available to low and moderate income people for 15 years at least. And somebody in Washington said they can be sold <coughs> off into the luxury market and uh, somebody can make a killing on top of it. I mean, it's wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, and my question for you is, uh, you said earlier that you said, uh, whatever you said was, you could sell it in accordance with the contract. Is that, is that what you're... I, I answered that. I believe I stated that. But even if I made a comment, I had no official authority to make the comment, and I had no authority to approve it, and my comment really was, uh, would have been just as good if the stockroom boy made the remark, because I was not in the chain of command on this project. Well, now, who, uh, do you know anything about how this idea, I mean, this is a very substantial waiver that's being asked for here. This is not a technicality, you know, a little, a little crossing out this word that doesn't quite fit. This is the, the Congress went through a very difficult time <coughs> in the late 1970s when these insured properties, you, I'm telling you something you already know, the insured properties that went into default and the uh, FHA said that their only job was to preserve the insurance fund and so they should be sold to the highest bidder no matter what. Congress passed various restrictions to see to it that these properties were held for low and moderate income use. So this was a very important policy decision that had been made at the congressional level to, to put these kinds of restrictions on to, to make sure that the property was directed. Now, do you know anything about who it was at, the, at the, uh, the New York office who generated the idea that these people should get a prepayment waiver. Because that's the key thing here, the prepayment waiver. And your name is associated with it the way it's been written, <laughs> as if it were your idea. Uh, my attorney says, Mr. Monticello, I don't know. I had no authority. I was not in the chain of command. And if I made a reckless remark, if I did, does that mean a regional administrator and the attorneys in Washington take a remark? And then again, why wasn't it verified? Why wasn't I not I asked for a memorandum explaining my position if I made the remark? I doubt that I made the remark. If I made it, I made a remark facetiously pay it off, which had nothing to do with my meeting with the man. Did you, had, had you seen, before these proceedings, uh, had you seen that memo with your name in it? I mean, is this no, something you no. knew at the time? Perhaps I did not see that. I don't recall seeing it. Uh -huh. So you, you, you know about it now because we've I been discussing it with it you and, and, yes, and because yes. the... I read about it in the newspaper. I'm uh -huh. sorry. Okay. Well, let me move on to, uh, uh, to the other area. <clears throat> um, when Mr. Monticello was here, we asked... Um, a number of questions about uh, the role of Senator D'Amato in the operation of the New York office and the extent to which um, Mr. Monticello received suggestions, requests, etc., from the senator. Um, and um, we also um, noted that, um, uh, that in the MOD rehab program, uh, in March of 1987, um, Mr. Demery wrote about, uh, about certain uh, MOD Section 8 applications, and he had a list that he called Senator D'Amato's requests, uh, which caused me to say there seemed to be a working hand in glove with the Senator and Mr. Monticello. I wonder what you can tell us 
about Senator D'Amato's contacts with Mr. Monticello or with the uh, area office and uh, the extent to which um, the Senator and Mr. Monticello uh, communicated with each other uh, on the question of, uh, of particular HUD grants, HUD projects, whether in Puerto Rico or in New York or elsewhere. My attorney says I should read a prepared statement, my relationship with Joseph Monticello. <clears throat> and the first part talks about Senator D'Amato. Prior to 1981, he wrote this, he, meaning me, and Monticello were not on speaking terms. On September 23, 1980, I was being honored by Bene Brith Youth Services. This is in 1980. I was called from the dais and asked, there was a gentleman outside who wanted to come in, sit down on a dais, be introduced and make some remarks. And I was told his name was Al D'Amato. Milton Goldberg, the fundraiser person, asked me my opinion. I said, I don't know Al D'Amato, and I thought this was a, a purpose for uh, B'nai B'rith Youth Services. I didn't know anything about politics, and I said, I don't think we should let him in. And we did not let him in. <laughs> I had to pay the price later. <laughs> you, thing. you now follow an open door policy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but we'll let him go through a statement. Uh, now, really answering your question, uh, prior to election day, around that time, uh, I was not on speaking term with Monticello, and uh, people were all surrounding Mr. Monticello and were very excited because uh, he stated, he stated that he was a personal friend of Aldemato's and that anticipation of Aldemato winning, becoming senator, would mean good things for him. Well, after election day, uh, there was a great deal of congratulations being given to Mr. Monticello. I thought he became senator. And I was at a meeting there, and everyone got up and shook his hand, and I sheepishly, foolishly shook his hand. I had a choice, either quit or shake his hand. <laughs> and I shook his hand. <laughs> uh, Ed Davis lost out and about money for regional Thank administration. Go ahead. No, it makes sense. <laughs> I had an answer, answer to Mr. Monticello, official chain of command to Mr. Davis. Uh, two offices merged, it became, what are you on? Read, don't explain it to them, because then I don't understand what you're saying. It'll read. All Mr. Right? Clara, I don't want to interfere with the, your advice you're getting from counsel, but I would suggest that uh, if there's a written statement, I uh, ask uh, that the Real United States Congress, Congressman, I really feel that I'm being rushed at this point, and I'm made to be looking a little foolish, where I think I cooperated, and either no. we terminate and I come back again, or give me a no. chance to answer no, the question. No, I don't want to rush you. Because and I live in New York, and parts of New York are called the motto territory, and I have to return there. Oh, I and understand. I don't want to rush my answers. Okay. I just, I just would ask you, I, I don't want you to rush. I, I, if you've got a written statement, I, one, one thing that you can do is to, is to have that written statement entered in the record in its entirety. Without objection, it will be so ordered. You want to know the relationship? And, and if there's a particular part of it that you want to emphasize, I'd suggest that you read that. Yeah. Right Joseph Monticello worked hard at his job. It was very clear by Mr. Monticello's comments that things were cleared with Senator D'Amato. Joseph Monticello frequently told me how he met with the senator on weekends and uh, remembers that uh, Joseph Monticello appointed Geraldine McGann, a person who is a neighbor, and when I say neighbor, meaning two or three houses removed from the senator, and she became executive assistant then she became director of housing, then she became regional administrator. Uh, Geraldine McGann told me she was lifelong friends, uh, but in my opinion, she is a, a capable person as administrator, but not as director of housing. That's my opinion. Uh, Mr. Monticello certainly talked about his trips to Puerto Rico and involvement with builders and the senator's 
efforts to create housing down there. I'm not stating the senator did anything wrong, but there was a very close relationship with the office and Senator D'Amato. And uh, Senator D'Amato uh, had great interest in housing. To what extent, I don't know. But, but Joseph Monticello always told me that he cleared things through him. And in fact, they had a list of cases that uh, the senator was interested in. He also had a list that the city of New York was interested in. Because in New York City, there is a ULIP procedure, meaning you have to go through districts to be cleared. And therefore, he had a list from the city and a list from the senator. I don't want to make a statement that there was anything wrong doing. But, the, but Mr. Monticello certainly worked with the senator. In fact, uh, in here it states that there was a phone arrangement in the office that he pressed a button and it went directly to the senator's office. But I think the, Mr. Monticello stated he spoke to the, Congre to the senator often. Yeah. Um, Eventually he said that. <laughs> well, uh, let, let me just sort of focus on a, on a couple of items. First, on the telephone. Yes. Uh, is, there was a special telephone connection between the New York office and, and the senator? I'm sorry, senator. I'm not up on telephone equipment, but there is a procedure, yes. You know, you just press a button and the number automatically goes through. Okay, okay now, this was to the, the senator's Washington office or his New York office? Washington office. And Mr. Monticello told you repeatedly that he cleared things through the senator. I don't know if he were, used the word cleared, but he discussed them with him. That he discussed particular projects with the senator? Yes. Um, you said there was a list. The Senator D'Amato had a list of projects that he was interested in. No, I didn't say Senator D'Amato had you a list. You said that Mr. Monticello had Mr. a list. Mr. Monticello had a list. That was, that Senator, that he... Either the city or Senator D'Amato, okay. right. But in other words, is this a list that you, this, this is a list that, that had things added to it from time to time, or this is a oh, particular no. list you're thinking about? No, at periodically there'd be rating and ranking on COBS or something going on in the office, and, and the technical people would review it. And there would always be an administrative assistant or executive assistant sitting in making comments on some of the proposal. Now, uh, there again, I got to be careful because we have technical people making decisions and uh, it was our, my job primarily to train them. Now, some of the things that disturbed me when I make these remarks that we had to talk to them, and one of the comments was that I used to uh, use my pressure with them. Well, one of the requirements was you cannot approve uh, subsidized housing in a heavily concentrated area of minority. But there's, there's no way you're going to build in Harlem or the South Bronx, if that's true. Or you cannot build in a heavily concentrated uh, low income. Or the uh, noise factors. Well, you don't build anything in New York with noise. There is noise and pollution all over. So I automatically used to tell these people, that's ridiculous. I waive that, you know. And they may take it, oi, I'm doing something wrong. Now, you know, when you're working in an office, and another statement I could make, that my chief appraiser when I was there, salary was like 35000 a year. I lost 10 chief appraisers that left my office at 35000 and went to work for 150000 a year. So all I'm saying is I don't blame the people. I blame the entire system and I don't know what the answer is to that. Okay, now, um, just to clarify this, uh, this list that you say that, <coughs> that, um, that they had, that this is a list of projects that included items that Senator D'Amato had indicated an interest in. I would state that they had a list of things that either the city, Washington, or Senator D'Amato commented on, yes. Yeah. And were any of these projects on the list, mod section eight projects, do you know? I don't recall. Do you have any recollection of involvement of Senator D'Amato that was either told to you, that you know of directly or that was told to you by Mr. Monticello with respect to mod section eight projects? No, I, you know, I'm a little confused. This. Mod section eight, uh, I don't even know when it started, but it was something that was phasing out. And uh, I'm not, uh, 
complaining about my health. But you got to understand, I was in a hospital a good period of time in 1984 and 85, and I retired early 86. So the last two years when this mod rehab program was in existence, I really lost control. Uh -huh. So you, you don't have any record? I don't that. recall, no. The, um, um, it would be, um, it would be fair to characterize the relationship then between Senator D'Amato and, and Mr. Monticello as very close. Oh, extremely close. They were friends. And it would be fair to say that as a part of that relationship, uh, they seem to discuss HUD business frequently. Uh, as a result of Mr. Monticello's comments to me, I would Based say, on, in other yes. words, what Mr. Monticello said to you, well, you, are, you weren't there and you didn't hear no, the I was definitely not there, no. And you never had, the senator didn't talk to you about these matters. The senator, I Ever was only with the senator on one occasion alone. But Mr. Monticello did suggest to you that there were frequent conversations about HUD projects with the senator. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Congressman Shays. Mr. Neclario, uh, your testimony is quite significant. And um, uh, I think that um, it may be that, that you may uh, want to come back. It may be the committee may want you to come back because you have a lot of insights that are, that are very helpful. Um, one of the challenging things for us on this committee is when, uh, if we know someone who's being investigated, that's a challenge for us. Uh, uh, Obviously, when our colleagues are mentioned, that's a challenge for us. So just like you have to go back to certain territory, and that almost had an ominous sound, uh, which I hope it, it didn't. It wasn't meant to be ominous. Um, you know, we have to work with our colleagues. Um, we also have a job to do. For me, it was um, very easy to talk about individuals because I didn't really know any of them. Uh, but I happen to know Jack O'Connell, and. Um, when Mr. Monticello came before us uh, on a Friday, I was given an article that was from Newsday that described the uh, First American Housing Preservation Association. It described e Eagle Capital, which ended up being some of the same people which Mr. Monticello now works. And regrettably, one of those individuals uh, was someone I thought I might know. Uh, the name on the list was John O'Connell. Uh, I knew I had to ask that question, and it turned out John O'Connell happened to be Jack O'Connell. Um, so um, I asked some questions last time about that relationship, uh, and um, uh, I'm led to believe that someone I know very well and who also gave me a contribution of $1,000 uh, may in fact be involved in something that I think is very wrong. Um, I, um, I want to ask you um, if Jack O'Connell uh, ever met with you other than that, uh, ever if you ever suggested to Jack O'Connell in any other time other than the time that uh, he was picking up a check or trying to get a check, did he ever suggest to you uh, that, that uh, I'm having problems with these properties, and did you ever at any other time other than that one time suggest, well, why don't you just sell all these properties? Uh, in a course of business, Jack or John O'Connell is related with Sheldon Goldstein. Right. <clears throat> Sheldon Goldstein has Will done... Will you speak into the mic, I'm sorry. please? Sheldon Goldstein did many jobs with HUD and the state, etc. cetera. Uh, and Jack O'Connell was with him most of the time. I have seen and spoken to Jack O'Connell many, many a time, mostly at uh, dinners, uh, functions, etc. I do not ever recall, or do I ever recall, John or Jack O'Connell asking me anything like this, because I don't think that he would do it. Because I think in his relationship with Sheldon Goldstein, Sheldon Goldstein would be the initiator of some important questions, and he would know where to go. Did you ever, with Sheldon Goldstein, uh, ever suggest that he sell off these properties and that he should try to get 
the waiver so he could sell these properties. No, sir. The challenge that we have is that we have this letter of April 12th um, to Joseph Monticello from Sheldon Goldstein. And the, the first part, just let me read this first part. It says, my partner, Jack O'Connell, has reported that as a result of our request to pay off the mortgages at Gregory Park 3, Mr. Naclerio has countered with a recommendation that we consider, in fact, paying off all the debt to HUD on the subject properties. Uh, frankly, the more we discuss Mr. DeClario's suggestion, the more appealing the idea becomes. Therefore, the purpose of this letter is to suggest that we feel what we feel is equitable is in arriving at an immediate prepayment of the mortgages. But before I get into the specifics, I think it's worthwhile to bring you up to date and so on. Now, I'm very clear that, that your testimony before us, and I'll just give you the opportunity to say yes or no, is that this reference that um, Sheldon Goldstein makes about your suggestion was, in fact, that time when Jack O'Connell was there to, to pick up a payment, and you said, why don't you... Uh, sell them all off. Is that correct? May I? Yes, the answer is that's correct. Okay. May I expand on that, please? You may. May I? Yes, sir. Okay. The letter is written by an intelligent person. It reminds me of some newspaper reporting. It does not state the letter was written to me. It says a letter was written. Isn't that correct, sir? Jack O'Connell has reported that as a result of our request to pay off the mortgage, Mr. Neclary has counted with the recommendation that we consider, in fact, paying off the debt. Um, Who was the request made to? This is a letter of Joseph Monticello right. to Sheldon Goldstein. Well, I think it implies that the letter was written to me, which is not the no, case no, no, at no, all. No, 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 no. This is, well. this is, this is a reference. This is, um, this is a reference to you in a letter, uh, and I only have one copy at the moment, but my, my purpose is just to make sure that the arrangement, the suggestion you made, which you felt was casual, then, as you have pointed out, has be kind of gotten written down, and you never wrote anything suggesting that. Your testimony, I'm, I'm, you nodded your head, you shook your head, so that's correct. I'm correct. I will say it verbally. Yeah. I did not write. I did not, I was not asked to comment on it officially. You never suggested to anyone besides Jack O'Connell that they sell off the property, correct? That is correct, sir. You never wrote any memo suggesting that they sell off the properties. The answer is no, I did not. But uh, we're talking about what year is this now? This is 1984. It is a long time okay. ago. Okay. Uh, you know, I think, again, I must state that I should be given the opportunity to look at the files. Yeah, I, uh, I agree with you. And so what we're going to say is to the best of your knowledge, you do not Oh, I would go even further. I'm sorry. I would go further, Congressman Shays, to the best of my knowledge, but 99 and three quarters percent, yeah. I was not involved with this project. Okay. Then what, then what ultimately happened is Mr. Sheldon Goldstein uh, writes Mr. Monticello, and then, and then, and I understand your problem, uh, Mr. Monticello then writes Mr. Barksdale, just kind of incorporating this as if this had been an official recommendation that you had made. And uh, since it's your testimony, you never made any official recommendation like that, never worked with these individuals to suggest that it happened, uh, I can see that you'd be pretty upset. I, I'm more upset because my relationship with Maurice Boxdale was excellent. He depended on me. In fact, I think in his prior years, he did some work with HUD and he asked me for advice and guidance. And I think when he became Assistant Secretary of Housing, he really gave me the feeling that he wanted to do a good job and to use my name without asking me for a memorandum really disturbs me. Well, Mr. Mon okay. This is from Mr. Monticello to Mr. Barkston. I understand. Now, let me just say to you that um, we're, I have some opinions about what I think of Mr. <coughs> Monticello's arrangement of, of, in a sense, assisting these individuals and then uh, ending up uh, being on their payroll for $125,000. And I just want to give you the opportunity. You in no way have any relationship with, uh, financial relationship with any of these individuals uh, from the... Um, First American Housing Preservation Association or Eagle Capital. Mm. You're not, no, no relationship. And whatsoever. you're not doing any work for them at all. Oh, absolutely okay. not. Okay. And you don't think that the thousand, fifteen thousand dollar check that you have a, a, can't remember, uh, it would not have been involved in any project they were working oh, on. Oh, no, no. The fact is, I can state it was not because this person was more or less complaining to me 
that he was not in that mainstream of getting things. Uh, no, okay, you made your point. In other words, okay. Uh, in other words, um, the answer is no. Yes, Mr. Monticello was still working um, for for HUD at the time you were doing this. You got this fifteen thousand dollar check. Uh, you don't know. I I was so me did yes. Mr. Monticello left in 1988. Okay. I believe, yes. Uh, let me just uh, say to you that um, you, you said that Mr. Monticello tried to engage you uh, in a financial relationship with this organization. Is this not correct? That is correct, sir. Um, do you still have the contract? Oh, I have the blank papers, I, I believe. Uh, well, if you do have the blank papers, I mean the unsigned papers, yes. uh, it, would you mind uh, presenting us a copy with that? Not at all. And I think it's a very good thing that you didn't sign up. <laughs> I was lessons. born in Brooklyn, sir. I was taught at a young age to be careful. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> count your blessings. And I have a good attorney, he said. Um, I just want to make one last comment. In your judgment, do you feel that a lot of HUD projects went to benefit um, the middle to upper income echelon of our society as opposed to um, the targeted group of lower to, to mi lower and middle income? I would state that the people who really deserved the housing did not get the full benefit because of games that were played. I would really not just love to participate and donate my time without salary to work with someone to benefit them. Okay, let me just carry it one step further though. Even our, our legally designed programs, uh, we've talked about projects in Beverly Hills, we've talked about some other projects. Uh, is, is it your feeling, working, have, having worked with HUD for such a long period of time, that quite often the tenants, tenant, tenants, uh, owners of facilities, uh, not, the, not the developers, uh, were quite often uh, less than the, than the poor or the uh, poor to middle income? Well, it depends on the program we're talking about. Right. See, the program that I talk about, the Ritz, yeah. I think that's a good program. Okay. I think it's good because it produces housing for a segment of the population, and that releases the other housing they come from so that other people can move into that. You, you so you your basic comment, and I'll end here, is that any time you increase the supply of housing, you benefit hou that's correct. the housing. Needs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm all set. You can't leave now. Congressman Weiss. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. DeClario, we want to express our appreciation for your appearance. And, uh, and you are dismissed. Uh, Thank you. Next witness. Um, Congressman, may I just make a brief statement? Please. If you wish Mr. Neclario's assistance in the future, may I urge upon you that the records uh, of any particular matter that you may be interested in, that we may have an opportunity to study them, and I'm sure that Mr. Neclario will then will give you his full support. I appreciate that, and be sure. I thank you, so. sir, on behalf of my client. Thank, thank, thank you both. Thank you very much. Our, very much. our next witness is Mr. Donald Maron, Chief Executive Officer of Payne Weber, <coughs> accompanied by Mr. James C. Treadway, Executive Vice President of Payne Weber. Are the gentlemen in the room? Okay, I understand they are just outside, so we'll be in recess for a couple of minutes and then resume. Our next uh, witnesses are Mr. Donald Meron, Chief Executive Officer of Payne Weber, and uh, he's accompanied by Mr. James C. Treadway, Executive Vice President of Payne Weber. We'll be, we'll be pleased to have you testify, gentlemen, if you'll first stand, please. Raise your right hands. <laughs> 